name is Iris Sager. I am Vice President of Global Learning Initiatives for the Center for Global Enterprise. We are at the halfway mark in our series of six expert connects on the digital supply chain. Today's session is the first of two we will do on digital supply chain technology enablers. The first is the increasingly popular topic of blockchain. <clears throat> Next week on June 26 at the same time, we'll look at another technology enabler, artificial intelligence and machine learning and its application in the supply chain. Before we start this week's Expert Connect, a few housekeeping notes. This session and all the sessions in this series will be recorded and posted on CGE's YouTube channel. At the end of the presentation, we will have a slide with the upcoming schedule for additional Expert Connects, as well as a link to the Digital Supply Chain Institute website for more information. We will leave approximately 20 minutes at the end of this session for audience questions. We'll also take them throughout if we have time. If you have a question for our presenters, you will see a button at the bottom of your screen, a feature that says uh, Q&A. Please submit your questions using the Q&A feature. We'll try to get to all the questions time permitting. As I mentioned, today's Expert Connect is about blockchain. The technology to hear some describe it is the next big game changer for businesses. But hype aside, technology or using any technology in a strategic way is a significant undertaking for a business. In this week's session, we will explore the business and technical case for blockchain technology, its application in the digital supply chain, and the results of a recent pilot project. We're fortunate to have two presenters today with true blockchain credentials. Our presenter, Sean Muma, is the technology research leader for CGE's Digital Supply Chain Institute, where he has been leading our blockchain work. Joining Sean as co-presenter is Jitendra Tethi, Assistant uh, Vice President leading blockchain for Aracent, a global design engineering firm that has recently completed a blockchain pilot project. Jitendra will share the quantifiable results of their recent blockchain pilot. Now I said quantifiable because in all the excitement over blockchain, quantifiable results of applying this technology have been scarce until now. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sean and Jitendra. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ira. Uh, next slide, please. Great, as we get started here, uh, for those of you who may have thought that uh, you're gonna learn how to uh, trade cryptocurrency this morning, that uh, that is uh, not part of this session. We're gonna talk about uh, blockchain, which is the uh, underlying technology, of course, to uh, cryptocurrencies, but we're gonna talk about blockchain in a manner that uh, as it applies to, uh, to business applications and specifically to uh, digital supply chains. So we'll give you an introduction on blockchain We'll talk about its use as a automation and transformation tool. We'll talk, show you a little market research from our recently completed survey. And, uh, and then Jatendra, who we're uh, fortunate to have with us uh, today, will uh, talk about a uh, um, pilot that uh, Aircent has, has run and its applications to its, uh, its clients. And from that, we'll move into a little bit about lessons learned, how you get started, and then talk about uh, future considerations. Uh, for those of you who tuned into the first couple sessions, uh, George Bailey talked a little bit about uh, new data models and, uh, do, and how they require new management tools uh, to, uh, to manage the data that's available and, uh, and make sense out of it. And of course, as you, uh, as, as you consume that data, and organize it in a manner that you can make business decisions, then you change uh, your workflow and, uh, and there's, there's impact to the way that, uh, that you do your business and manage your, manage your supply chain. So we're gonna talk about, uh, about uh, blockchain as a, uh, as a workflow uh, modeling tool today. Uh, next slide, please. First, what is blockchain? Uh, and blockchain is far more than the, uh, than the technology that, uh, that powers the crypto market. It really is a, uh, a cross enterprise transformational tool that we'll uh, talk more about as, as uh, the session continues. But it allows you to have a, uh, a distributed database uh, that's decentralized, meaning that, uh, that as, you, uh, as you leave your enterprise, uh, it can, uh, it, it can, uh, be part of, uh, of the workflow to your, uh, your suppliers and also your customers. So it can create an end-to-end -end workflow for you in a decentralized manner. Uh, as the data is written to, uh, to the blockchain, 
Uh, and one of the big questions is what data do you put on the chain and what, uh, and what data do you keep off the chain? Uh, but whatever is written to the chain is immutable. It cannot be changed. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later on about how that can be challenging uh, as, uh, as, as you deal, deal with, uh, with uh, regulations around personal, uh, personal data. Uh, but what's there on the blockchain is there forever. It's, uh, it's distributed. And, uh, and if it's a public blockchain, you're not quite sure where it may reside over time. And of course, the data that's on the blockchain is encrypted. It's, uh, it's hashed. It's, uh, it's uh, typically a very secure 256-bit key that you're dealing with. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to penetrate. Next slide, please. So how does the blockchain work? Well, each member maintains its own ledger. A way to look at it is as a distributed ledger technology uh, and that copies can, uh, can reside across the network. Uh, you can have a number of nodes. Uh, those nodes are, uh, are, are maintained through a uh, consensus algorithm. Uh, there's a number of different uh, blockchain technology providers out there. Uh, most of them have a unique uh, algorithm for gaining consensus among the nodes in the network. Uh, but as each uh, as data is added to uh, to the chain, a uh, a new block is created, uh, and there's uh, forward and backward pointers uh, created that uh, that uh, link that block, and uh, are so also part of the uh, the integrity of the chain and the security of the chain. We mentioned that the entries are permanent. They're transparent. Anybody who participates in the network can see them. You can search on them and you can view the transaction history. So, so one of the things you're seeing that, uh, that blockchain, as a blockchain use case today uh, is, uh, is the concept of digital twins. Uh, as you create a physical asset, you may create a digital asset and then you maintain a trans transaction log against that, that digital asset uh, as, it, uh, as it moves through your supply chain, as it moves through your manufacturing process, uh, as, it, uh, as it moves through its, uh, its life cycle. So you have the, uh, the entire life cycle of, uh, of a particular asset, uh, particularly good in, uh, for example, in the, in the aircraft or the aircraft engine business, uh, where, uh, where engines are moved from plane to plane, parts are uh, put in in various locations uh, around the world. Uh, so you can track the, uh, the history in, uh, in uh, repair history of the engine, and you can also track the history of the parts and where they came from and down to the technician who put them in through the transaction history that's linked to a, uh, to a digital asset. Uh, all members of the network have copies, distributed ledger technology. Uh, if you participate in the network, you have access to the data uh, and you have, a, uh, you have a copy of the ledger. Uh, and as, uh, as we talked previously, the, uh, the blocks are, uh, are all approved by everyone in the network before they're, uh, before they're linked. Uh, the block information, it could, uh, it could be anything. Uh, it can represent transactions, contracts. Uh, there are some, uh, some uh, nonprofits out there that are doing research. Accord Project is one of them. On, uh, on how you put uh, actual physical contracts onto the blockchain and manage it through a, uh, through a blockchain workflow. You can put assets, identities, really anything that can be described in a digital form, which is virtually anything, uh, can, be, uh, can be put on a blockchain and maintained that way. All the data is uh, encrypted, it's, uh, it's hashed, uh, you have a private key, you have a public key, the combination of those two get hashed together to ensure the, uh, the integrity of the block that, you, uh, that you're adding to the network. Uh, next slide, please. So how do you think about blockchain? Um, and uh, in our view here at the Institute is, is you ought to think about blockchain as you're looking at, uh, at, at potential use cases in terms of the value you will receive from, uh, from automating that use case and putting it on the blockchain. Don't think of it in terms of proof of concept. That'll probably, uh, that'll get you a set of results, but it won't really show you the value that uh, is inherent in the, uh, 
in, in, in the use case that, uh, that you're looking at. So always think in terms of proof of value. Uh, that's one thing that we have learned as, uh, as we've gone through the pilots that, uh, that we've done here at the Institute in conjunction with our members in, uh, in technology providers. Uh, it is the under, blockchain is the underlying technology that powers Bitcoin, but, it's, uh, but Bitcoin is just one use case. Uh, the technology has, uh, has uh, inherent power in game-changing power uh, as a distributed technology that helps manage whether it's manufactured product as, as we're talking about today. And think about it as a transformational tool because it is a transformational tool. It allows you to transform beyond your enterprise boundaries. Uh, and, that's, uh, and, and, and that's very powerful. In a distributed fashion, in a trusted fashion, uh, it is an automation tool. It's one of many automation tools out there. You need to look at, at uh, blockchain as, uh, as part, of, part of your automation tool set and make sure that you're selecting the right use cases uh, to, uh, to apply blockchain to. In the, uh, here at the Institute, at the Digital Supply Chain Institute, we have, uh, we have developed what we call the Blockchain Return Index, which is a, uh, which is a tool that uh, assists you in uh, evaluating potential uh, use case cases and assessing the value that, uh, that you could potentially achieve by, uh, by implementing that use case. Next slide, please. So we talked about blockchain, what it is, uh, a little bit about the technology. Uh, we'll get into more detail with, with Jatendra in a few minutes on, uh, on uh, the, uh, the depth of, of the technology and, uh, and how to apply it. But let's talk about what makes a good blockchain, uh, a blockchain use case. Uh, it's good for pro cross enterprise uh, transformation where a single ledger is imp impractical or not trusted by the members in the network. Uh, it's good uh, when intermediaries provide limited value or add complexity. I think one of the great examples is the, uh, is the shipping industry and logistics uh, where there are freight forwarders or custom agents. There's lots of intermediaries that, uh, that provide relatively limited value and add a lot of, uh, a lot of overhead to the process. Uh, it's good where uh, transactions are, are entered by multiple parties and those parties have to interact. Again, if you, uh, if you look at the shipping industry, you've got the, uh, you've got the freight carrier, you've got, uh, you've got customs, you've got the shipper, you've got the recipient. They're all looking at the same data. They are uh, potentially want to update uh, uh, portions of information within a shipping record. Uh, so there's a lot of interaction that, uh, that go, goes back and forth today that all goes through intermediaries. Uh, imagine the efficiency that uh, and improvements you can make if you could eliminate the, uh, the intermediaries in a trusted uh, manner. Blockchain allows you to do that. Uh, and then uh, you can, uh, on top of blockchain, you can, uh, you can put a smart contract layer, view that as a process layer. It doesn't have to be a, a, a contract in traditional sense of the word. It's, uh, it's more a workflow. So you put smart workflows that, uh, that trigger in uh, Jatendra. We'll talk about how they did this at, uh, at Aerocent in the, uh, in the payback they got. Uh, but you've got a, uh, a contract layer that, uh, that manages the workflow as, as something, you know, so, such as a product moving through your manufacturing process or your supply chain process. Uh, is put together. You can uh, you can check on it. You can have trigger points that uh, that get updated where the information is forwarded and passed on to to other members in the in the network. Next slide, please. Okay, some uses for uh, for blockchain. Some uh, some supply case uh, supply chain use cases that I think are uh, are powerful examples. We talked a little bit about uh, about shipping. Uh, there's a company out of the UK called Marine Transport International that I think is uh, is probably the uh, the leader or one of the industry leaders right now in uh, in automating um, shipping logistics. Uh, they they've done some pilots with Rotterdam, Rotter, Port of Rotterdam and the Port of Hull in the UK. Uh, they have been adopted by the uh, by the UK as the uh, the model for uh, for automating. Uh, shipping. 
Uh, they've got uh, consensus within the uh, House of Commons right now. And of course, as, uh, as the UK, uh, as, as you go through Brexit, then you've got a case where the, uh, the UK needs now to have trade contracts with uh, each member of the European Union. And so they're developing models to do that. Uh, you also see that virtually uh, anyone who has a blockchain has identified this as a use case. So IBM and Maersk, for example, have a joint venture. Uh, SAP is, uh, is, is trying to do a, uh, a platform uh, and attract members to it. Uh, this, to me, is a very powerful use case for, uh, for blockchain. Track and trace is another one. Uh, you've probably seen IBM's commercials on, uh, on farm to, uh, to table tracking of fruit, uh, especially valuable when, uh, when, uh, when you have uh, uh, bad product that, uh, that may enter the food chain and you can identify uh, where the product was distributed and from what farm it came from. Uh, over time, I think healthcare, personal healthcare, your personal healthcare records are, uh, are, are gonna be a, uh, Another uh, uh, powerful use case that will be adopted by the healthcare industry uh, that will give you control over your health data. It will give you control over who sees it and what they see uh, and allow you to interact with your, uh, with your medical providers uh, and, and, uh, and pharmacists in the future. And uh, then, of course, we have Aricent. Uh, Aricent has, uh, has looked at, uh, at the software development supply chain uh, put in place a, uh, a blockchain-enabled uh, uh, process uh, that goes across development platforms, and uh, Jatendra will give us some more detail on that. But there's lots of use cases out there. There's also lots of hype. There are lo lots of uh, bad use cases that are be being implemented. And when I want to say bad use cases. It's, uh, it's use cases where blockchain may not be the, the best tool for the job. So you got to choose carefully. Uh, you got to look at some of the criteria that uh, that we gave you uh, earlier to help you with your evaluation, and ensure that uh, that blockchain is the right tool. It's a complex tool. It's complex to form networks. It's complex to uh, to implement. It's complex to uh, to incent people to uh, to use. And of course, it comes with you know, especially in a public blockchain, uh, it comes with a uh, lot of overhead trying to uh, trying to track. Uh, blocks that are added and uh, gain consensus throughout the network that the block is valid. Okay, next slide, please. However, huge investments being made in, uh, in blockchain today. Uh, tremendous investments, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of hype, very few results to, uh, to date that you can really point to as, uh, as game changers, but they're coming. They're, uh, they're around the corner. So, and, in 2017, we, uh, we saw almost a billion dollars in, uh, in, in venture funding for blockchain. Uh, this year, IDC is estimating that there'll be uh, 2.1 million in investment, and we saw about 300 million in just the first quarter this year. Uh, about a third of that investment's in the US. We're also seeing a lot of investment, a lot of companies in, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, that are blockchain skilled and have a uh, have a good set of skills and uh, and are making making good progress in the market. So I think you know last year there was a lot of hype. Uh, there were a few pilots, uh, very few things, if any, in production. Uh, this year you're seeing more structured pilots, more value coming out of those, uh, more companies popping up with skills, more applications that uh, run on top of the blockchain. And, uh, and I think the market is starting to coalesce. And of course, it will sort out uh, over time and consolidate over time. Uh, but I think we're right on the cusp of, uh, of seeing, seeing some major, major changes uh, to workflows in automation as a result of blockchain. If you look at it and you go through the criteria and say, uh, say what other tool is out there that's distributed, immutable, uh, enables uh, cross enterprise automation, uh, there really isn't uh, there really isn't anything else out there today that fits that criteria. Distributed databases are not the same as a uh, as a distributed ledger in uh, in blockchain capabilities. Okay, next slide, please. So blockchain, blockchain everywhere. You can't uh, you can't pick up any publication, any newspaper, any magazine, and uh, and not see blockchain being mentioned there. However, when you uh, when you get underneath it. Uh, there aren't many results, proof of concepts, ideas, 
Uh, we talked about IBM and Maersk. We talked about what is SAP is doing in the uh, shipping and logistics areas. But everything is, uh, everything is just at the beginning right now. It's in the idea stage. Uh, some pilots being run. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, when is this stuff going to all come together? And I mentioned uh, at the beginning that uh, here at the Institute, we, uh, we conduct a survey every year. Uh, we had uh, half a dozen questions this year in our survey. I uh, got 112 responses, I believe, uh, to those questions about uh, how corporations, enterprises are thinking about and where they are on, on their implementation and pilots. Next slide, please. So looking at some of the results of our surveys, um, as it applies to, uh, to supply chains. The first question we asked was, uh, will, will blockchain technology transform your supply chain? Everybody agrees, you know, virtually 58% agree, 13% strongly agree. There's another 34% sitting in the neutral camp, but you know, for where we are today and for an emerging technology to have close to 60% of the respondents say, uh, this is a game changer. Uh, tells you that uh, that uh, blockchain is on the uh, on the forefront of people's minds, and they uh, and they recognize that it's something that they need to uh, go investigate and uh, and deal with. Next slide, please. Next question: How will uh, your supply chain uh, benefit from blockchain? And I think towards the right hand side there, um, you could probably guess. Uh, you probably would have had this, had the same sort of answers on uh, where blockchain. Uh, adds value to the supply chain, uh, specifically in logistics. Uh, we're back to that uh, logistics use case we keep talking about. Uh, supplier visibility, uh, what's your supplier doing? Do they have the, uh, the fabric on hand to, uh, to produce the, uh, the finished goods that you need? Uh, we're, uh, we're running a pilot uh, right now with a, uh, with a uh, aerospace company uh, who wants to know, for example, where, the, uh, where, where their supplier is uh, in manufacturing uh, uh, tail sections of, uh, of their aircraft. And uh, of course, their, their suppliers uh, subcontract components, so they want to look at tier th beyond just, uh, just tier one, but tier two, tier three, and tier four suppliers to get a better visibility into, uh, into potential delays uh, or, uh, or issues with, uh, with supply. Uh, forecast and planning, uh, blockchain, if you run it, uh, and we ran a pilot um, with a consumer goods uh, uh, manufacturer that uh, uh, goes from their customer uh, all the way through their supply chain. So you have complete visibility from uh, and forecasting capability for what the, uh, what the customer might order uh, through all the way down through your supply chain as to uh, uh, which uh, which of your uh, your factories might have uh, might have capacity, uh, might have the uh, right materials on on hand, and can uh, can deliver quicker, and enables you to identify uh, uh, potential delays in uh, in fulfilling the order for your uh, for your customer at an early point. Uh, counterfeit goods is is uh, is one procurement is uh, is another good use case. Uh, of course, payments triggered by smart contracts as you go through the uh, as as you go through the process, uh, making sure that uh, your subcontractors have sufficient working capital as are getting uh, getting their payments as uh, as quick as possible. Uh, regulatory requirements uh, that is uh, you know to me uh, meeting regulatory requirements is uh, is almost a use case unto itself. Uh, but certainly uh, everybody, all enterprises face uh, regulatory requirements of various kinds, whether that be uh, the labor that produces the product or meeting uh, carbon emission standards. Uh, there are, uh, and the blockchain enables you to assure uh, that uh, uh, properly applied that, uh, that you're meeting regulatory requirements across a, uh, a broad spectrum in, uh, in many, many, many countries. Uh, next slide, please. So getting down to the individual companies, you know, how, are you, how is your company thinking about supply chain? Uh, you'll see from this slide that uh, only 4% say that they're at the implementation stage. And probably if you went and looked at that 4%, they're uh, relatively small, self-contained 
uh, within one business unit or maybe between a couple business units sort of implementation. 31% uh, say they're reading about it. 26% say, hey, we're, we're watching to see how, uh, how the technology and market evolves. Uh, another 22% says, well, we've, uh, we've at least set up a, uh, a small team to go look at it. So, uh, so, so, you, so you add those numbers together and you, you see that three quarters of, uh, of the respondents are, are not at a, uh, at a point in time where they're actually applying the technology. So this gets back to lots of, lots of talk, lots of hype, but few results to date. Okay, next slide. Well, when do people uh, who responded to our survey think that uh, that blockchain is going to become of age? Uh, you'll see the majority of people think it's still three to five years out before it's a true uh, production ready technology that uh, that'll have significant impact on, uh, on their business and their business models. Now, one of the reasons is, uh, is not the technology itself, but it's the complexity of uh, managing a, uh, a distributed uh, uh, network, the governance that's required to manage that network, the, uh, the data governance of knowing where your data resides and, uh, and who has access to it. So there's a number of things that need to, need to be worked out, I think, before, uh, before blockchain is, uh, is wildly adopted. But uh, everyone is, uh, it's, it's there. Uh, everyone's investigating it. Uh, it's, uh, it's coming. It's, uh, it's probably not uh, prime time ready yet. Next slide. So let me, uh, let me turn it over to uh, Jatendra now, who will uh, talk about what they, uh, what they did at Aerocent, the results they've got. The uh, wow. point, point here as we get started is that uh, that as you look at uh, and read about blockchain, you'll see examples, but you won't see the proof of value. You'll see proof of concepts, but uh, it's hard to identify what the, uh, what the actual return numbers are behind that. Uh, Arison has done something different here uh, in, that they, uh, in that they approach it from the proof of value standpoint. So let me turn it over to uh, Jatendra to, uh, to walk you through what, uh, what Arison has done. Jatendra. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. I can hear you fine. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we really kind of uh, were looking for is, uh, is to attack a problem statement of improving the overall life cycle and productivity of how software product development happens, because that's really kind of the core of what Harrison does in terms of uh, providing engineering services and design services to our customer. And uh, uh, when we looked at how typically a product is uh, developed and uh, you want to drive more agility and uh, productivity uh, to reduce the time to market uh, for taking out that product, you really can break it down into uh, various phases of development uh, pretty much every organization would uh, delegate that work to different teams, possibly, possibly different organizations and contractors. But uh, truly, the intent is to drive the productivity at a overall execution level. Um, while uh, the part of the answer is uh, really adoption of DevOps and automation to improve the productivity, uh, unfortunately, at an aggregate level, the results don't show up because uh, what you're really doing at an uh, at a, at a overall product level um, uh, productivity is to make sure that the dependencies which we have on different teams, different stakeholders is met uh, contractually and uh, the quality at which the uh, deliveries are done is uh, flawless. So the idea was, how do we improve the cycle time? How do we improve the productivity? And how do we improve the quality? So we, uh, we did a proof of concept uh, with the intersection of DevOps and, uh, and beads. And uh, we deployed it internally uh, in a couple of projects, which uh, we uh, deliver for customers. And uh, we collected the matrices of 
how the productivity happens, the cycle time happens before and after. And the results were pretty pretty interesting and, and, and uh, encouraging. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, read the overall white paper, which is published on the DSCI website, which kind of gives you more detail in terms of what matrices we went after. But the fact that uh, we were tracking various KPIs and monitoring them in the general visibility of what's happening in the overall development life cycle really kind of uh, led to improvement in productivity and quality. Next slide, please. Okay, so what what did we kind of build? Our, our solution, we call it BEADS, uh, which is a blockchain enabled DevOps solution, uh, is really a, a kind of a overlay layer on top of all the DevOps tools and investments which are done in a particular organization uh, with the intent to really find out what's really happening in the workflow underneath those tools. Uh, typically, you would to use tools for doing your source code management, your requirement analysis, your builds, your release pipelines. Uh, but what is really important to understand is uh, at what frequency you are doing deployments. What are the bottleneck processes between a handoff which happens from a development team to a testing team to an operation team? and uh, uh, can that slack be kind of uh, removed from the overall workflow? So that's that's the first part, which is building uh, building a layer which connects to various DevOps tools in, in in an organization and get the key events from such tools. The second is really about uh, building KPIs on top of those events and enforcing them using policies which are modeled as smart contracts in a blockchain world. Um, what are these KPIs? Uh, the KPIs are at, at no point in time, your code coverage should fall below uh, 80%. At uh, no matter what, you would do a nightly build. No matter what, you would do a weekly release. These are enforceable policies which we understand very well in plain English and we want to enforce on top of uh, the software development activities which were happening. Uh, the tool really kind of allows you to model them, uh, deploy them as smart contracts on blockchain, and make sure that uh, these smart contracts are fulfilled at all points in time. And if they are not, then there is a way by which uh, someone has to, uh, someone gets notified and has to take a action to, uh, to take care of that. Um, the, the other reason why, uh, a blockchain is super, super important and a key ingredient to the solution is the fact that uh, product development has decentralized. I mean, look at your mobile phone uh, and, and look at the amount of components which go into it, the amount of software that goes into it. Uh, it is uh, sourced from multiple organizations and, and brought together to form product. Um, when things happen in a multi-organization setup. Uh, as part of the product development or software development, you, you have dependencies in terms of uh, getting a particular piece of software with the required quality at a given time and being able to enforce a certain set of quality rules which every organization needs to follow. Uh, blockchain enables you to realize this in a multi-organization setup and enforce these rules which are agreed by all and are therefore uh, providing a level of confidence and bringing trust into the system. So, uh, so that's really kind of, I mean, how we kind of conceptualize the solution and we, um, we, we implemented that. Uh, so that's your next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to cover a few key highlights about the solution and, and the capabilities and value it kind of uh, brings back. Uh, first of all is uh, the workflows. And so that's if you can just uh, toggle through some animation, I think uh, there is one, yeah. Uh, yeah, one, one back. 
Thank you. So uh, the first one is really uh, around workflows. Um, so any software development or product development, there is an inherent workflow which goes behind the scenes. And uh, the idea is to really understand that workflow and identify the steps which are sort of slack inside the steps in the workflow. Um, uh, in effect, what you are really trying to understand is uh, what are the what are the elements of waste and uh, which which can be eliminated. Um, just to kind of give examples, uh, the fact that uh, the 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 build was ready and the software team, the testing team took uh, two days for them to start the testing, is a is a is a good visibility to make sure that that delay doesn't happen. And once you are able to identify and crunch that, uh, you are improving the overall productivity uh, by elimination of such slack and waste into the into the workflow. Um, so that's what basically uh, we get. Um, the beads will listen to the various events which happen from various DevOps tools. And you may be using a Jira or a Jenkins or a GitLab or Chef for deployment. Uh, but it will tie it together into a workflow and uh, model how much time is kind of wasted between handoff from different teams and different tools. So that's the next slide, please. Um, second aspect is matrices. Uh, matrices are uh, essentially the uh, interpretation and aggregation of events uh, which are collected from various DevOps tools. Uh, examples of those are uh, how much lines of codes are committed by a developer in a day to how much uh, of builds happen and how much is the success rate of those builds uh, are some of the examples of matrices which you want to enforce. All these matrices eventually become a way by which you are enforcing policies on top of it. Um, so examples like uh, enforcing that uh, code coverage is is it's uh, on a particular level at all times becomes a kind of smart contract which sits on top of the matrices um so that's your next slide please um traceability is uh, everything which is written and read from various tools which are involved in the uh, software development life cycle is written into blockchain so uh, you would be able to uh, verify whether that transaction happened uh, and who did that. So in case of um, uh, in case of identifying uh, any issues which may come up later, like uh, uh, identifying who was the person who actually approved the use of a particular open source software and who was the corresponding uh, vulnerability testing team who approved the use of a particular version of open, so open source software are the events which are written into blockchain. Uh, and because it is immutable and you can trace it back to where it originated from, you have a complete lineage of what, what really happened in the, in the overall execution of the life cycle, which uh, is, is beneficial from two perspectives. One, to understand how things happen. Second, uh, to really enforce the uh, the uh, that the deliveries happen with a particular quality and and timeline objective in mind. Uh, so, that's the next slide, please. Finally, is the visibility. Uh, uh, given a multi-organization, multi-vendor like kind of a scenario, you would have a situation wherein. Uh, say a vendor one or a team one would basically use their own set of tools for development uh, and would not really like to share uh, and give the complete access to the other teams in terms of uh, what they are doing. Uh, but the, the idea here is not really to get a visibility at each and every uh, event which is happening or every transaction that is happening. What you're really, really interested in is knowing things are fine at an aggregate level and, uh, 
and enforce certain constraints on top of it. So the idea is that um, teams and vendors can continue to use the tools which they are currently using. It's not a replacement for uh, any DevOps tools which they are currently using, but uh, beads will sit as a layer on top of it to understand the events which happen in those tools and collect them into blockchain uh, such that the minimalistic information which is required to enforce the quality and the smart contracts on top of it can be enforced uh, on blockchain. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is how it would typically look like in terms of deployment, um, multiple organizations, multiple tools. Uh, the, the red dot is sort of a beads uh, node, essentially a blockchain node, which sits into that organization and is responsible for collecting events from various tools that are used within that organization and uh, bring it into a network which is really central and visible to every stakeholder involved. Uh, the platform takes uh, the ownership of putting smart contracts on top of it, uh, such that any deviation uh, from the KPIs which are agreed and enforced are bubbled up and are visible again to all the stakeholders. So, so that's really kind of how a typical deployment would kind of uh, work in a multi-organization, multi-team kind of a setup. Yeah, so hope that gives you a kind of peek into kind of what we did. Uh, uh, and like I said, uh, we kind of uh, piloted this uh, solution for two projects and uh, we came up with uh, a significant improvement in the productivity and the and the, in the quality of, uh, of of the software developed. Um, when it comes to technology choices, uh, while there are many examples of what can be what what can be used, uh, it really is not really about technology. It is really about focusing on your use case and see how you can relook at the existing process and uh, derive value from bringing visibility to all stakeholders from it. Uh, that, that's really kind of the central, the central part of it. Um, when it comes to platforms, uh, all these platforms which uh, uh, are, are listed down are pretty much uh, popular and, and have their own merits uh, in terms of the throughputs and and scalability and the ease of use. Uh, so choose probably depending on uh, whether you want to do a, a public or a private. And second would be the programming language, uh, which uh, you and your teams are comfortable with. Uh, but like I said, it's uh, the, the choice of technology should be should be secondary to to, to the use case. Uh, you can realize the same use case within with uh, with any technology. In our case, uh, uh, the Beats is basically built on top of Exonum, uh, which is a private blockchain uh, implementation built using uh, Rust and Java, and, uh, and, and allows us to basically have a private network of nodes in which uh, we, can, we can share information uh, within that network. Um, so yeah, so that's it. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So, Sean, maybe a uh, good time. I hand it over back to you uh, to okay. cover the rest of the section. Okay. Uh, why don't we uh, pause here and maybe take a couple of questions, Jatendra? Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out before we uh, before we start uh, taking questions, though, is uh, um, it's important, and it's important with any technology to ensure that you adapt your workflow to the technology. So for those of us who were around in the uh, beginning of the ERP days, you know, for example, people were running their workflows on, on, uh, on spreadsheets. SAP came along or Oracle or whatever ERP system you want to talk about. And, uh, and a lot of people, and I was in Asia at the time, uh, took their spreadsheet process and, uh, and stuck it on SAP uh, using none of, the, uh, none of the benefits, none of the capabilities of SAP. 
And of course, about a week after doing that, their employees were back to using their spreadsheets because they were more efficient for managing, managing the, uh, the process. And, uh, and they weren't taking advantage of the inherent capability in, in SAP. So you need to do the same thing here uh, at, at, with blockchain is look at your cross enterprise uh, uh, workflow and make sure that you adapt your workflow to the tool and, uh, and, and, not, uh, and not the other way around. Uh, so Ira, uh, do we have questions here that uh, we, can, uh, we can answer at this point? Or you know, please, please folks, if you have questions, now is a good time to, uh, to ask them. Well, I know there was one question. Do we uh, explain what BEAD stands for? Uh, BEAD, that yeah, BEAD is an acronym uh, for uh, Blockchain Enabled uh, DevOps Solution. Uh, while while that it is an acronym for for what I what I said, it turns out that the architecture also looks like beads, uh, the way I described in the in the previous slide, because you have these beads nodes which are deployed at each of the organization, and together they kind of uh, tie in together. So yeah, it's a, it's an acronym, uh, as well as I mean the way the architecture looks. It's a it's a solution which Arisent has uh, developed. Uh, at the intersection of blockchain and DevOps. Hey, thank you. If you have questions for uh, Chitendra or, or Sean, please uh, submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We have some questions, but I'm going to ask one. Chitendra, uh, one of the um, slides that Sean showed, the results of a, uh, I guess one of our surveys, indicated that most users felt that blockchain is three to five years out from becoming commonplace or widely used within their organization. I was wondering if you agree with that assessment and also um, what do you think will uh, accelerate that acceptance or what do you think can hinder that acceptance? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the technology of blockchain has been there for for a while. Uh, so it's not like, I mean, it's it's the new technology on the block and, and stuff. So I think uh, the adoption of blockchain uh, will really become very use case specific. And uh, I, I think uh, Sean, Sean did kind of talk about some of the use cases which are kind of visible out there, but essentially the use cases which is really kind of adding value in a multi-organization, multi-party kind of a setup uh, would be the kind of leading in use cases of how the adoption will kind of uh, start. I think I kind of also agree with the with the assessment that for it to really become mainstream, probably it is kind of three years out. And I think the reasons are really uh, more to do with the uh, with the alignment of the regulatory bodies, the standards bodies, and ecosystems coming together to really kind of uh, make this happen. Uh, so. I think ecosystems play a, a major role in really kind of adoption of a solution. So if you really look at, uh, say, um, I mean, an, another of the solution which we are working on is really around, around telcos and how the health of uh, cellular networks are kind of uh, shared across various operators in, in a region, really that involves every operator to come together and agree to participate in a set of nodes and network uh, which they see a value on. Uh, so the way it will really happen is probably using the standards or, or consortiums kind of getting formed to really propel and make it mainstream for it to happen. So in a way, uh, long answer, but I kind of agree to the survey that one to two years, probably the, the, the use cases where it is obvious uh, and three to five when everything comes together and, uh, and then it becomes mainstream. But for sure it will happen. Thank you. All right, I have a question from uh, Gregory Millen. Uh, presently, what are the major forces that are coming into play that is driving blockchain deployment forward? For example, do you think the recent EU GDPR rollout uh, will have major impact? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, thanks, Gregory. The, uh, the questions kind of have, uh, you have two questions here and they have uh, answers at the, uh, the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, what's driving blockchain deployment is, uh, is the ability to, uh, 
to automate workflows uh, and transform your business processes uh, to create a, uh, a logical uh, enterprise, if you will, right? So, so you can uh, link, link all your suppliers to your customers, uh, potentially you can share data, you can know exactly where you are in the process, you can trigger, you can trigger payments automatically. Uh, it's, uh, it, it enables transparency and it enables uh, uh, the information to be trusted by the, uh, by the parties in that, uh, in, in, that, uh, in that workflow. Now, you also ask about GDPR, which is the uh, uh, general data protection uh, uh, requirements rights that, uh, that the EU just ruled out. Uh, that is on the surface diametrically opposed to blockchain because blockchain data is mutable, can't be changed, uh, whereas GDPR requires you to, uh, to be able to delete data if a uh, individual says, I, I no longer want that, uh, that data to be, uh, to be available. Uh, I'm in the process as part of the research we're doing here at the Institute of, uh, of authoring a paper on that with, in conjunction with uh, a couple of uh, very premier law firms, one in the UK and, uh, and one here in the US, where we are taking a look at that and, uh, and trying to figure out how you adapt the GDPR regulations to, uh, to, uh, to blockchain. Uh, so give us give us some time to figure that out. Probably uh, probably won't be too long, but there's uh, there, there's going to be impact on on blockchain, and this is this is one of the things actually that will inhibit or slow up uh, deployment in the future is complying with uh, with local regulations and ensuring that you're complying with uh, with local regulations. Uh, Gregory, it'll probably uh, it'll probably be a, be a couple months. I probably another six weeks before it's available. Uh, can, can I can I just start to what Sean said? Yes, please. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I think yeah, Sean, you summarized it well. The only thing which I would add is uh, uh, there would be new architecture patterns and uh, approaches of how people would look at kind of doing these things. So, uh, a, so so yes, I mean everything in blockchain is written and immutable, is is correct, uh, but. Uh, the patterns of, I mean, what remains on the chain and what goes off the chain uh, can really kind of become the ways in which you kind of overcome such kind of uh, restrictions. Uh, so um, what you are storing on the chain is really just a hash or a pointer to uh, what the actual asset or data is. So um, so the what really goes on the chain and what really goes off the chain becomes an important consideration as you kind of look uh, for realizing the solution in light of uh, GDPR. Great, thank you, Jadinder. All right, um, Oluska again, uh, Sanyulo asks, uh, when you hear blockchain, what comes to mind is uh, use in a cryptocurrency, which is, I think, what Sean had mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and he wants to know about other use cases where uh, blockchain can be used. And obviously, we've been discussing those uh, in this session. But I'm wondering, uh, just to extend on this, is uh, supply chain the killer app for blockchain? Is there one killer app? Yeah, Jatinder, why don't I uh, try and answer that first, and then you can uh, you can add to it. Uh, I think that uh, that most uh, people that are dealing with blockchain and blockchain pilots at this point would say that supply chain is uh, is the is the app or the process that will, will uh, benefit most from blockchain because that's uh, that's that's really the intersection of most corporations with with outside corporations. And this enables you to get visibility across your supply chain, across your customers, potentially out to your customers' customers, and uh, in understanding what demand is out there, and understanding the ability of uh, of your suppliers to uh, to meet that demand and and in what time frame. So as uh, as I go around and talk to experts in this area, both supply chain and technology, and uh, in universities such as uh, MIT or Stanford or, or Berkeley uh, or Frankfurt, 
uh, they will all say that they see uh, supply chain uh, benefiting most from, uh, from blockchain in the future. Jatendra, comments to add to that? Uh, yes, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, yes, that's the most sorted out kind of use case, but I don't think uh, there is, this is the only killer use case. I think uh, uh, the killer use cases are really from a perspective of when you look at, say, information registry. Uh, we, we are seeing kind of governments looking at land records, uh, digitizing the um, the education degrees and certificates uh, sort of making an information registry which is kind of immutable and and cannot be changed are kind of uh, things which we see here uh, the other is really about information providence which is uh, really about tracking down the information to the source of where it originated um, we have seen kind of examples of that uh, tied to physical uh, assets like i mean lineage of a diamond and where it originated and how it came to your your finger but you really can kind of apply that to uh, the uh, to the information set uh, as well as to how did it kind of come together uh, which kind of would uh, uh, extend to uh, documents files uh, verification verifiability and and stuff uh, if you also look at it uh, devops uh, i mean i would really it's a pretty interesting use case realization of uh, how you can apply a blockchain to a software development process um, uh, is kind of a pretty unique intersection. So I think uh, there is a lot of use cases which we can really see uh, and look at from a lens bit of uh, uh, trust between parties, data provenance, mutability of, con uh, of the content and applied to into uh, into our um, respective industries. Uh, we have certainly looked at uh, uh, certain industries where Allison focuses on including uh, telecommunications and industrial uh, and software. Um, as, and we have lined up a, a few use cases which are really focusing on these industries. And if you really see, probably it is orthogonal in a way to Kind of where the majority of the use cases people are going after, which is financial, healthcare, um, and, and stuff. So, so yes, I think um, it's it's a matter of looking at uh, the use cases with the lens of uh, what characteristics uh, you are looking to realize and what value you can derive uh, to really come up with hmm, where it really can 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 be a relevant technology to. Um, build a solution on. Thank you. All right, we have, I think, uh, time for one uh, more question, and I'll take it from uh, Ayo uh, Alatoyu, who asks, how effective is blockchain likely to be in engagement at uh, B2C scenarios? Supply chain is mostly B2B, where all parties are fairly well resourced. resourced. Uh, how about a uh, business or how uh, can a business use it to engage, say, a much dispersed and numerous stakeholders, say, customers through a mobile infrastructure? I don't know who wants to take that one. Yeah, Chachindra, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, so there are, yeah, of course, uh, the B2B part is very clear. Uh, that's, a, that's a clear um, intersection of, I mean, various parties being entrusted into a common information and driving value from there. But um, there are B2, B2C use cases as well. And kind of I, in the previous answer, I kind of touched upon a few use cases like uh, lands registry or uh, tracking a high value, high net worth kind of item to where it originated and uh, how it was manufactured. Uh, these are uh, these are kind of the questions which the end customer would be kind of interested in knowing, uh, though they won't really participate into the blockchain network as kind of bring a node into the network, but they would really plug in into uh, um, the kind of set of services which sit on top of uh, uh, another blockchain network. So the the mode in which the uh, participation of B2C will happen would be somewhat different uh, compared to B2B, but there are enough use cases where uh, where the end customers are really interested in knowing uh, 
uh, the, the sourcing of materials, where it came from and how it was manufactured and who designed it and, and, and aspects like that. Uh, and those would be very interesting use cases uh, around uh, uh, blockchain. Uh, the other one really also would be, it's kind of a between B2C and B2C, B, B2B is like warranty. I mean, manufacturers are interested in knowing the end customer of who is using their product and, and really tie that warranty chain uh, it's it's really kind of going beyond kind of B2B and B2C kind of a thing where where it is really crossing boundaries. So I'm, I'm sure there are there are there are certainly there are more use cases on the B2B side, but uh, there is there are enough use cases uh, on the B2C side as well. Thank you, thank you, Jitendra. Uh, Sean, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Uh, well, if we could, I'd like to sure. uh, cover a couple points on the summary slide. Uh, so Guthrie, if you could back up to that. Uh, there's, there's a couple important things that, uh, that we didn't get time to cover in detail. Uh, the, uh, and let me leave you with this thought. The, uh, the challenge of blockchain isn't so, me so much the, uh, the technology, right? The technology is there. The technology works. Uh, you, need to, uh, you need to pick the workflow and, uh, and manage your, uh, your automation, make sure you're setting the, uh, the, the right objectives for evaluating that uh, as you look at, uh, at cross-enterprise workflows. But where it gets difficult is in managing the ecosystem. Because your, uh, your suppliers, for example, may not want you to know how much fabric they have on hand uh, because that, then you can determine their ability to deliver. They may not want you to know how much capacity they have available uh, because you may negotiate harder if you know that they're running at 25% capacity instead of 90% capacity. Uh, how you form that open governance system is, uh, is not simple. So you need, to, you need to figure out how you incent people to participate. You need to think about how you manage a uh, open governance environment. You need to think about how you meet the regulatory requirements. We had a couple, couple questions around that, but, uh, but each country, and, you know, some places, you know, states within countries have a different set of regulatory requirements, protection of personal data, where data can be stored, uh, many countries such as Malaysia don't allow personal financial information to be stored outside the country. A, uh, a, a, an open blockchain, you're not quite sure where the data is going to be, uh, be stored. So that drives you to a private blockchain. It, uh, it drives you to ensuring that all members of that blockchain that, uh, that have access to personal data are inside a uh, sovereign boundary. Uh, so you need to consider these things. And to me, that's what will... Uh, will slow up adoption. It's not going to be uh, the technology that inhibits adoption. It's going to be managing the, uh, where the data resides, who owns it, uh, how you comply with local regulations, uh, and, uh, and how you incent people to, uh, to participate uh, within, uh, within uh, your, uh, your network, your ecosystem that you're creating here. So focus on value, focus on uh, adopting your process to fit the, fit the technology, uh, and, uh, and I think you'll, uh, you'll be successful in the future. Uh, right back to you. Thank you all for participating. Great. Thank you, Sean and Chandra. Uh, we really appreciate your time. And uh, you saw the schedule, you see the schedule right now for the next uh, uh, topic, and that will be on artificial intelligence and machine learning on June uh, 26th at the same time. And for more information about the uh, Digital Supply Chain Institute. Here comes the uh, online uh, URL and you can find us there. And please uh, reach out if you want to know more uh, or have questions about this presentation. As I mentioned at the beginning, we will post this on uh, CGE's YouTube channel. Thank you and have a good day.